Hey everybody, we're back with Civic Review, and we are going to be looking at three groups today that can influence and watch our government. Those, of course, would be citizens, the media, and special interest groups. So let's get right to it. And our objectives for this video are to take a look at these three groups, individual citizens, media, and interest groups, and see what kind of impact it has on watching our government to make sure they're doing the right thing and influencing our government. And we're going to hear a lot of vocab, like media's watchdog, media's agenda setter, gatekeeping, bias, endorse or endorsements, lobbyist, and political action committees. All right, and before we actually get started, what is influencing? What is monitoring? We've already gone over influencing uh, in our other video series about the Enlightenment, and we know that means uh, it affects the nature and development of something. Anyways, what affects our government and how do we move either to the right, the conservative side, or to the left, the democratic side? Uh, that's what we're going to be taking a look at in this unit. And also the word monitoring. Monitoring simply meaning to watch or keep an eye on something. And most people, remember, do not live in Washington, D.C. We go to school here in Florida, and so we really have no idea what's going on over there. And we leave it up to other groups to keep an eye on the, on the government for us. Okay, and remember, our government uh, can be some, like the White House or who our president is. It can also represent Congress, the lawmaking body, or even the Supreme Court. Even locally, our governors and mayors of the city. And these three groups are going to be the ones watching them, and that's citizens, the media, and interest groups. And we're going to start first with citizens. It's fairly simple and straightforward, so we're going to get right to it. That's just we the people as individuals. And like we were saying earlier, citizens don't really do a great job of watching the government because they don't live in Washington, D.C., and their jobs kind of prevent them from doing so. Like, say they're a teacher. Well, they've got to be in the classroom teaching, and they can't really go to the White House and say, Yo, Mr. President, are you following all the rules? And so the ways that they can influence the government are some simple things, four things, really. That would be voting. You should be casting votes to choose who's going to lead them. That would also be protesting, letting the government know we don't really like what's going on about particular issues. Individual citizens can also influence their government by attending civic meetings. And at these meetings, they can sort of voice their opinions on how they like something or how they don't like something happening, sort of in a local environment. And the last thing you can do really is to run for office. And that, that being, if you don't like how the government's running, is you can run for office and then make those changes in the government. All right, and that sort of wraps it up for citizens. So we're going to move right along now to media. And media can do much, much more than just influence their government. They can actually monitor and watch them very closely. So let's get right to it. First thing we're going to do, though, is talk about what media actually is. And media can be many, many things. It might surprise you. Not just TV and Internet, um, but radio, magazines, books, movies. We tend to forget that these things are also considered media, but media they are because they're transferring information to us from outside sources. Now, it is the media's job to be there and watch our government, to be in the White House and asking the tough questions to our president and the staff that work there and the senators. Um, that's sort of what they do. Uh, it's their full-time job. I'm a teacher. I don't have time for that. But the media, fortunately, gets paid to do these things. And so we call this media as a watchdog. And we kind of want to think of just your average guard dog or just regular old house dog uh, that sits at home and kind of protects and watches the family. And if they just sense that something is wrong outside or there's an intruder nearby, what they're going to do is they're going to growl and they're going to bark and they're going to try and alert people something's not quite right. And that's what the media does. If they see the president doing something that is against the Constitution or some governor putting money into his own pocket or you know doing something illegal, they're going to growl and they're going to bark and they're going to let us know, the citizens. Okay, once a to the problem, the people are ultimately the ones who are going to be able to make a change. But just knowing that there's something out there or knowing that something's not right is extremely helpful for citizens. 
Now, the media also can influence or change our government and push them in certain directions, whether they're making conservative policies or laws or making liberal policies or laws. And we call this media as an agenda setter. And we think about the agenda. That's really the plan of what we're going to do. We have an agenda every day in class. And the media sets that plan for what kind of shows they're going to put on their, their news outlets. Now, the media sees a lot of things, and they make decisions every day about what stories they're going to tell or let through the gate, and maybe even more importantly, what stories they're not going to tell. So let's say the black car here in the picture is a story about how the president is a fool. Well, they're going to let that through the gate. They're going to put that on their TV show. But this biker here, wow, that's something the president did very well. Well, we're not going to put that story on our news channel. That's not in our agenda. Now, sometimes it can be about money. Remember, media is a business. And so if a story is not going to make them any money, they're going to close the gate like that poor biker. It can also be based on bias. Maybe the plan for the media is to help one candidate from one political party and to make another candidate look really, really bad. In this way, the media has a lot of power in framing stories. I love this image here. We can see the whole picture. The media has captured the whole picture, which is one man attacking another with a knife. But whatever they choose to portray or not show us can change the way we perceive the events as happening. And in this way, when they set the agenda, they can actually influence the way our government behaves and what kind of laws they're going to make. Okay, and we're going to move on now to the final group that can monitor or influence our government and that's interest groups and we're going to be starting with the National Potato Council. Yes, this is actually true. This is a real interest group. Now, let's say in our cafeteria, we know we don't eat super healthy and then they would like our lunches to be healthier. And so who's going to actually make that decision about school lunches? It's the U.S. government. The USDA is actually going to make that decision because schools are a part of government, as we can see here by the funding. And so they might decide potatoes, no, those are bad. We don't want more potatoes. We want less potatoes. And this simple decision is actually going to impact a lot of people. Farmers over here on the right are not going to be happy because they sell potatoes. Some students who want to stay fit and active or be healthier are going to be happy. And some students might not like it because they want their french fries. We can even have schools like and dislike this because it's going to cost them money uh, to replace cheaper potatoes with more expensive veggies. And so that's the basis of interest groups. So if we look at this simple idea of having less potatoes, well, farmers we know are not going to like that. But the more farmers that sort of join the team, they'll be more likely to make a change. And so we have the National Potato Council. These are potato farmers who want to better themselves economically. And we can write down what an influence group is now. That's a group of people with the same ideas who want to make some changes in our government. And those changes being they, these potato farmers want to make more money. Now, they're going to have to try and convince the lawmaking body or the USDA that, you know, potatoes aren't so bad for students and it's actually more beneficial for schools as a whole. And so we ask ourselves, how are potato farmers going to accomplish this? Because they're busy farming all the time. They can't just go to Washington, D.C. and make their case. And so what they're going to do is they're going to hire somebody for them. All the potato farmers are going to put together some of their money and resources, and they're going to pay somebody to go to Washington, D.C. and go whisper in the ears of these senators and members of the House. Here's a little breakdown of how it works. The special interest group are the farmers. The lobbyist is somebody that they hire to bring their cause about bringing potatoes back into the cafeteria. And they're going to go talk to politicians. And these politicians are going to be making some choices and decisions to potato or not potato. And the lobbyist who represents these farmers is going to say, hey, if you say we're going to have more potatoes in school, then uh, all the farmers are going to vote for you. We're going to donate to your campaign and, and help you get reelected. And we're going to go out and we're going to teach people why potatoes are actually healthier for students. And so that's what these organizations and interest groups are doing. And keep in mind, other interest groups are fighting against these causes. So it's a battle back and forth that's happening right now in Congress. Yes, there is a battle over potatoes happening in Congress. And that's just how the government works. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we should write down what a lobbyist actually is. And that is a person who takes part in an organized effort to influence legislators or lawmakers. 
Another thing these groups can do is endorse a candidate or endorse a person that's running for office. And endorsement simply means to support. And we see athletes are endorsed all the time by these companies and brands. But people can actually endorse candidates and so can interest groups. So the National Potato Council can endorse a presidential candidate and say, hey, if you're a farmer, you should vote for this guy because we're all going to vote for this guy. Same team. Wait, 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 wait. Are you telling me interest groups can pay politicians to change laws? Well, yes and no. Political action committees are organizations that raise money privately to influence elections. And they have to follow very strict rules, which means these potato farmers have to perform their political action committee and then follow those rules. Okay, we are almost all done here, so let's just review very quickly these three groups and how they make changes in our government. Citizens do four things. They vote, they protest, they run for office, they can attend civic meetings. The media is gonna be the one sort of keeping an eye on our government and then setting their own agendas for what stories they're going to show on their news channels. The last group is interest groups and they're going to hire lobbyists to represent them uh, in their fight for making changes in the government. They can also endorse candidates and then of course inform the general public why they should change these laws or why we should have more potatoes and school lunches. It's actually not so bad. That's what they're going to be doing. Okay guys, that's it for now. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of my video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. We'll make more videos soon.